Let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Stephen Rockauer. I am president of the Center for Healthy Maryland, and I'd like to welcome you all to our annual um, lecture on ethics sponsored by uh, Dr. Tom Allen and his lovely wife. We've been doing this for over a decade, and uh, it's always been a very valuable and uh, ethical lecture to uh, to listen to. And tonight we'll have another uh, good one. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Ben Stallings, the chair of the uh, ethics committee, to uh, for the next part of the lecture. Um, thank you, Rocky. Um, as Rocky said, my name is uh, Dr. Ben Stallings, and I am the chairperson of the of MedKai's Ethics and Judicial Affairs Committee. I have the honor of introducing um, our moderator for this lecture, uh, Dr. Carol Ritter. Uh, Dr. Ritter is a board certified is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and practices in Baltimore County. A graduate of the Medical College of Wisconsin, Dr. Ritter completed her internship and residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. Dr. Ritter has been active in organized medicine since 1989 and a member of numerous professional medical societies. She is a longtime activist and advocate for patients and physicians. Dr. Ritter has been president of the Baltimore County Medical Association and a member of MedKai's Board of Trustees and House of Delegates. She's a recipient of the Dr. Thomas E. Hobbins Distinguished Service Award and MedKai mm -hmm. Distinguished Member Award. The delegates meeting. Okay. What's very impressive is that Dr. Ritter has treated women Editorial. and delivered babies in developing countries, including traveling to Honduras and Haiti to staff clinics in small towns. She also has given her time and energy to helping physicians in the state of Maryland, testifying in Annapolis during the 2003 liability crisis and producing a documentary about the crisis. Now I give you the esteemed Dr. Carol Ritter. Thank you, Dr. Stallings. That's very generous of you. So welcome everyone again. Thank you for joining us this evening for the 2023 annual Thomas E. Allen MD Ethics Lecture, Abortion, the Ethical and Legal Ramifications in Maryland, a Sanctuary State. In the realm of evidence-based medicine, science remains our guiding light. Science informs the policies and laws we create. Science ultimately shapes our social values and judgments. As Sir Isaac Newton once said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. We, as a medical community, stand on the vast knowledge and research of countless scientists and doctors that precede us. But what transpires when the science of medicine clashes with the laws of our land? When a 50 year old constitutional right, one that's deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition is overturned. Especially when such misconstructions affects women's lives, particularly women of color with such intensity. Tonight, we'll delve in into the profound impact on us, the doctors. How does this shift impact our professional decisions, our trust in institutions, political pressures, and our inherent compassion to care for our patients and each other? What becomes of our commitment to science, scientifically proven care when it transcends mere malpractice and enters into the realm of criminal law? With the rollback of Roe v. Wade, the challenges faced by women and their healthcare providers have been magnified. As Maryland stands as a sanctuary amid this turmoil, we must ask ourselves, what is our duty to protect? What is our duty to treat? What is our duty to educate and train? And what responsibilities do non-OBGYN doctors bear in this context? To help us navigate this intricate landscape, MedKai has assembled an outstanding panel for us tonight. I am both thrilled and privileged to introduce our esteemed colleagues on this journey with us 
and look forward to moderating what promises to be a compelling conversation. We will first give the four panelists time to present, and then we'll save room at the end for questions. You can raise your hand at the time of Q&A, or if you have any questions during the uh, chat, we can, we can put in the chat, and we will try to get to them at the very end. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist will be Dr. Ann Banfield, MD, support certified obstetrician gynecologist at MedStar Women's Health in Leonardtown, Maryland, in the beautiful Southern Maryland across the Potomac from Virginia. Dr. Banfield received her BA in biology, cum laude, Capital University, Columbus, Ohio, and her degree from West Virginia University School of Medicine. She then went on to complete residency at Western Pennsylvania Hospital. Dr. Banfield is president, St. Mary's County Medical Society and an active member on the board of trustees of MedChi. She also served as ACOG's representative, American Cancer Society, National Roundtable for Cervical Cancer. Dr. Banfield loves snow skiing, scuba diving, yoga, reading and traveling. She will present her unique um, on the ground perspective coming from Maryland from states with strict reproductive health policy restrictions. So without further ado, Dr. Banfield, you're on. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritter. Um, I'm gonna be sharing my screen here. And so as many of you know, that takes just a moment. And if someone can give me a thumbs up that we have success, Great. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the fact that I actually am relatively new to Maryland. I came here um, in May of last year from West Virginia. And in, as many of you know, West Virginia is sort of the uh, polar opposite uh, of Maryland when it comes to policies and um, uh, laws related to abortion services. Um, what is perhaps um, less obvious is even prior to the fall of Roe and the Dobbs decision, um, what many of us were experiencing um, in these states that you can see here that have more restrictive um, attitudes and uh, laws related to abortion is we already were seeing the effects of the difference in what our um, politicians and laws uh, were impacting us. Even prior to the fall of Dobbs, West Virginia only had one active clinic that provided abortion services. Um, we had a limited number of providers. We did have a few providers at other locations, um, many of which were actually not made public um, because of the attitudes and issues that we dealt with in West Virginia. And 90% of reproductive age women in uh, West Virginia lived in a county without an abortion provider. When you contrast that to Maryland, only 29% of reproductive age women in Maryland were living in a county without an abortion provider um, recently. And Maryland is considered one of the very uh, protective states. Um, and as many of you know, Maryland actually has shield laws in place to protect providers in the state of Maryland who are giving services um, that are needed by some of our um, patients who come from these other um, more contentious states. Uh, West Virginia actually passed an amendment to their constitution um, several years ago, giving no constitutional right to an abortion in the state of West Virginia. So from the point of view of many um, of the folks uh, who are in government in the state of West Virginia, they were very poised uh, for the fall of Roe and for the Dobbs decision um, to immediately be able to enact the restrictions that they wanted. Um, and there really is a complete ban now in the state of West Virginia with very limited um, exceptions. And so this is the experience that I came from um, coming to Maryland and moving to a sanctuary state. It certainly made a massive difference um, in my experience of um, the fall of Roe and the impact that that had on patients. Um, we spent a lot of time and effort uh, throughout the year trying to prevent even worse laws from being passed in West Virginia and to ameliorate the effects to the extent that we were able. Um, and you don't realize how much uh, bandwidth that takes up until suddenly you're living in Maryland 
uh, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so these things make a huge difference. When it comes to the ethical argument uh, from the medicine side for abortion, of course, you know, we want to think about our four sort of pillars, if you will. Um, and ACOG uses these particular pillars very proactively to make the argument and to help have us us have tools um, in place when it comes to folks who have questions um, or who we are trying to approach about this issue and we are trying to provide those best services to patients and get across the point of why it is so important that we continue to have these services available. Um, many of the, you know, these are things that are self-evident. And so I don't need to read the slides to you, but, you know, we as physicians want to make the best decision for our patients and it should be their decision. And so we should be working with them hand in hand. And when you're in a specialty like OBGYN, of course, this question can come up all the time, but when you're in other specialties and things that we have seen across the United States, as these laws have changed our specialties like oncology, suddenly not being able in states like Texas to have an appropriate conversation with their patient who has cancer that needs to be receiving treatment, but maybe they're pregnant. How can you have a full appropriate discussion with that patient about their individual choices when you can't discuss the fact that they are pregnant and the impact that that could have on their treatment and care? We want to make sure that we're always considering the best um, and safest things for our patients. And if you cannot tell your patient that when you have rupture of membranes at 15 weeks gestation, the medical recommendation based on the science is to have a termination of that pregnancy because the likelihood of a positive outcome for either the mother or the baby in that case is essentially zero. How can you have an appropriate ethical conversation where you're providing appropriate information to that patient in a setting that restricts your ability to have that conversation? We always need to be thinking, of course, about the um, pillar of justice, especially um, in a system that we know has been built um, over the years on racial inequities um, and continues to clearly struggle with this when we think about um, what we see with the maternal mortality crisis and the way that it um, disproportionately affects black and brown women and the fact that we know that we need to be working on these things. But when we cannot provide safe, appropriate care within this system and it is being made worse, we are clearly not living up to our ethical uh, the ethical pillar of justice, and we need to continue to work on that as well. And again, all of our colleagues and other specialties are in the same situation we are. We all need to be upholding these things as a house of medicine. Otherwise, we continue to be undermined within our um, own practices and our own um, specialties. And finally, we need to do no harm. And we certainly know that not being able to provide full information and full access to care to our patients is certainly a way that we can cause harm. It should not be up to anyone else but a physician and their patient what treatment options are reviewed and discussed. It should not be the um, decision of someone else whether or not you're going to be causing additional harm. And we know that medication abortion is safe. We know that surgical abortion is safe and there is excellent science to back up those um, arguments. And so when we see these um, research articles coming out of um, poor science and non-peer reviewed journals, as a house of medicine, it is very important that all of us look at that research very carefully and we all stand up and say, this is not right. We saw during COVID that when the House of Medicine does not stand together and when we allow folks to undermine um, those pillars for us, we end up in a situation where we are unable to provide the best care to our patients. And really they become confused as to what is the best care because there is so much misinformation available and public. So I just wanted to touch on the, the sort of where the art ethical argument for abortion comes in all of those pillars. You can obviously see the details in the slides um, and we'll provide that information later. Um, but I really wanna talk a little bit also about resources and tools that are available, particularly to those of you who are not OBGYNs and who may not be as familiar with these, um, what is available 
that can help physicians um, addressing these issues. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is um, ACOG does have uh, an abortion is essential website that is completely dedicated to all things abortion when it comes to the ethics of why we our patients need access to these services why it is important and what the arguments are on each of these pillars. In addition to the things that I shared with you tonight, there's more detail on like how to have a conversation with people, how to start a conversation with people who have different views and have different mindsets on these issues. And there are many, many resources there um, related to this topic. The second um, website here, the Guttmacher Institute, for those of you who are data heads and who enjoy looking at the numbers and who wanna know you know, exactly what's happening and where and when. The Guttmacher Institute is a private um, uh, not-for-profit organization that has been doing abortion research and reproductive health research more in general for years. You can find all sorts of information on and data on abortion here. This is where the uh, map that I shared at the beginning of the presentation came from. They have tons of resources. Um, they have fact sheets on each individual state and what the current status is. And in addition to that, for those of you who may be in other specialties, um, they have information on the status of testing for sexually transmitted infections, the status of uh, teen pregnancy, the status of uh, teen um, ability to get care for different uh, reproductive services. So this is an excellent uh, resource also for folks who maybe have questions um, or things that uh, they would like to have more information and hard, good hard data on. So that's um, and then legal resources, which is not something that I don't think any of us ever thought we would need to be worried about, um, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, ACOG has worked with um, other organizations and had out of part of that, has, there has been the development of the abortion defense network. And this is a place where physicians can go who have questions related to abortion care. So if you're in Texas, where speaking of abortion can get you into trouble, and you're an oncologist, you can go to this website and you can get information and legal advice about what the state is there for, for you. If you are in West Virginia and you need to know, you know, what's my, what's my uh, risk or my liability or what, what are my options here, you can go to this resource. So this is an excellent resource, especially for folks that may be in those states that do not have protections um, and that need have questions and need advice. And then finally, for any of you who may have contact with patients who have questions or have a need for resources, um, I have two different resources here. One is the abortion funds um, network.org, um, and this helps to provide funding for patients who do need to go to other locations to receive their services. So if you're here in Maryland and you get a phone call from a colleague who is in West Virginia, which happens to some of us, um, and they're talking about like, hey, I have this patient, what, what can I do? This is a resource for the patient um, as far as if they need funds to help them with travel. Because as we know, many of these patients who are in these states um, do not have the funds and the um, resources that they need to get to locations uh, where these uh, services are available. And then finally, the Abortion Care Network. And this is an uh, this shares abortion providers so that folks who are seeking services um, can locate perhaps the closest um, services to where they are um, and to allow them to uh, better uh, access services um, to the best of their ability, depending on what their restrictions in their state are. Um, so just briefly in closing, I think that the thing about um, that I think is driven home to me over and over again is that when it comes to the ethics of having a more equitable set of laws across our country, it is not people like us on this call. It is not our friends and family who are ever going to have the issues related to accessing care. You know, we all live in a sanctuary state. If nothing else, you can bring your family member or friend to this state to get the services that they need. But when we talk about people who do not have the resources that we have, even in the state of Maryland, if you're in Western Maryland, 
getting the services that you need can still be incredibly challenging because you are in part of the state that does not have active services available there. And so I think it's really important that we keep in mind um, when it, we think about that pillar of justice, which again, I think is incredibly important. It is not just that those who have can always have what they need. And those who have not, we are making it harder and harder for them to access the services that they need. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions at the end. I appreciate you guys inviting me to be here. And I hope you appreciate the experience of someone coming from a state that is significantly different. Um, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Ritter. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Field. It's so interesting that you use those pillars of justice because historically, you may or may not know, those are from the Belmont Report, which is in Maryland, and that came out after Tuskegee and what happened with the syphilis trial. So we didn't have any of that before 1972 is when, when those pillars, and we started doing consents and everything. So it's very interesting that you use that for this topic today. So our next speaker, let's get on to the next panelist, is going to be, I believe, Attorney Kess. Correct, Debbie? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so here we have um, Nashona Kess, Esquire, MLS, Masters of Legal Studies, right? Her talk is entitled Reproductive Rights, Historic, Historical Legal Perspective. Um, Attorney Kess, Lucas Kess, spent her primary years on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Ms. Kess graduated from Morgan State University with a Bachelor of Liberal Arts and Philosophy and continued her education by attaining a Master's of Science in Legal Studies from Kaplan University, now known as Purdue University. At Kaplan, she successfully completed courses that included ethics, family and legal systems, functions of state government, and legal process. Attorney Kess then went on to attend Widener Commonwealth University Law School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. During her tenure in law school, she studied constitutional law, which generated her interest in civil rights advocacy. After graduating from Widener Law School, Ms. Kess began working at Sina Law through ad advocating for children in foster care, as well as, as well as other family law and estate planning matters. From working as a legal assistant to becoming a licensed attorney, Attorney Kess has successfully worked in the legal profession for 15 years. She has been an avid advocate for marginalized communities for more than 18 years, advocating for women's health, civil rights, environmental justice, equitable housing, and many other equity issues that have a negative impact on their community. Attorney Kess is second vice president of the NAACP Baltimore City Chapter. She also chairs the branch's Legal Redress Committee, where she leads their effort that focuses on policy advocacy, as well as, as investigating civil rights and discrimination complaints. So no further ado, Attorney Kess, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, and let me share my screen before I get started. All right, I believe you all can see. I'm just adjusting my screen here. Thank you all for joining tonight. Um, I always like to say you could be anywhere else. Um, so I appreciate all of you for choosing to be here today. Um, just discussing this very important um, issue Regarding abortion rights, reproductive rights, however you want to, uh, you know, term that. Uh, my name is Nishana Kess. And as you heard, let me, all right. I am a licensed attorney in Maryland, a reproductive rights advocate, civil rights advocate. And um, I have, my affiliations are at the bottom. Um, Ms. Uh, Ritter did speak on um, some of them. Uh, so I have the, the list here. All right, so what I wanted to do here, my agenda is to just kind of discuss where or how did we get here and where are we now? I feel like sometimes it's important to talk about the foundation. Um, although I understand that, you know, you all are very, very um, educated, 
um, and you all understand what's going on. But sometimes we, we don't have a full grasp of all the things that are very important to, let's say, abortion rights. So I just kind of wanted to go over that. And, um, and then I know my other panelists will discuss some of our uh, considerations, uh, for the legal considerations. So how did we get here? So let's just start there. How did we get here in the place that we are now? Roe v. Wade. I know you all know what Roe v. Wade is. I know that you know what Roe v. Wade did um, in the end, but I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's the famous lawsuit regarding abortion rights. Um, Jane Roe, well, that was not her actual name, but uh, that is a name, her alias um, that was given. Jane Roe, an unmarried pregnant woman, she filed suit um, on behalf of herself and others to challenge a Texas abortion law. Um, additionally, a Texas doctor ended up joining in on that lawsuit. The reason why is because the, the doctor determined that the law was vague and that particular doctor was arrested and other doctors had been arrested because they did not follow whatever the law um, stated, which was super vague. They didn't understand how to follow the law and um, the state did arrest many medical individuals because of that. Um, here, Jane Roe, she did challenge several other constitutional issues, but one of the things that were picked up was the 14th Amendment, amendment the, the rights of privacy. Um, the court said that forcing someone to continue pregnancy can create risks of physical health, mental health, finances, and social stigma. Um, the court determined that the due process cl clause of the 14th Amendment protected the right of the individual to choose whether to end their pregnancy prior to viability. And viability is so important um, here. So a blanket abortion bans were considered unconstitutional. And at that time, there were about 40 plus states um, who found that abortion was illegal. Um, however, over time, right, other states ended up limiting abortion as opposed to having the blanket um, abortion laws. Did Roe v. Wade create an absolute right to abortion? The answer is no. It did not create an absolute right to abortion. Um, the court weighed the legitimate state interest um, against different factors and um, they just determined that it would vary based on the gest gestational age, right? And so we know that first tri trimester, the court said that that decision is between the doctor and the childbearing citizen. Within the second trimester, the court said that the state may impose some limitations, right? But, but again, not a blanket um, limitation. But the third trimester, once the fetus reached viability, the state may regulate or prohibit so long as there were exceptions made to certain criteria, such as the life of the mother, the health of the fetus, things like that. So Roe v. Wade did not create an absolute right to abortion, but it did say that there were some limitations that could be made, but that a woman had the right to choose whether or not she wanted to have an abortion based on the trimester. In Roe v. Wade, um, well, following Roe v. Roe v. Wade, there was Pl Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Um, but I wanted to highlight one of the quotes um, that was stated, until the viability line was crossed, the court held that a state could not impose a substantial obstacle on a woman's right to elect the procedure as she thought proper in light of all circumstances and, complexity and complexities of her own life. Um, and so those things were kind of brought up and talked about. But the problem here um, after Ro Roe v. Wade was that this decision remained case law and was not codified, which is why we are brought here where we are today 
talking about the different, um, you know, what the different um, states and what everybody's doing and how states are regulating individuals' rights to an abortion. Uh, states or Congress could have codified this law because unfortunately, even though the Supreme Court is the one who heard this case and decided this case, precedents can be overturned all the time. And this had been said over and over again throughout the years that Roe v. Roe v. Wade was on the chopping block. And so as soon as there was a Supreme Court panel, <laughs> justices, that um, would challenge Roe v. Wade, we are now in the place that we are, right? Um, and so it was always the hope that the states or Congress would codify Roe v. Wade. And in most cases, that didn't happen. Okay, so Dobbs v. Jackson came about recently, and that's why we are kind of in the place that we, we are in and the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, in 2018, there was an act that was passed in Mississippi and which um, stated that uh, 15 weeks was the limitation for a, an abortion. Well, in this case, it wasn't a real, it wasn't an individual, but it was a medical facility that challenged this particular law. Okay, they filed an appeal, they lost, the state filed an appeal, they lost the appeal, and of course, that's how it came to the Supreme Court. The justices determined that the Constitution did not mention abortion at all, and because it did not mention abortion, that right was not deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, nor implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. Basically, they're saying at the time that the Constitution was written, there was no consideration for abortion, right? And so because abortion was not um, specifically mentioned in the Constitution, when the Constitution came about, then therefore it's not there and we shouldn't really consider it, right? Because it wasn't there in uh, whatever year, seventh, the 1700s, when women weren't even considered full citizens, right? And for the most part, men were the ones writing all the laws and men did not consider the health of a woman at that time. But that is what the um, justices in Dobbs v. Jackson stated that there was no history or tradition in abortion when the constitution, constitution was created. Justice Roberts stated that the constitution is therefore neither pro-life nor pro-choice. The constitution is neutral and leaves the issue for the people and their elected representatives to resolve through the democratic process in the states or Congress. Justice Thomas stated that the right to abortion is ultimately a policy goal in desperate search of a constitutional justification. So what they're also saying is, back to what I um, kind of talked about in Roe v. Wade, it should be up to the states to create this law that they so that the people that that I guess pro-life pro-lifer so desperately want that this law should just it should just become policy if you want it so bad um and and your your local uh legislature should pass this particular policy or this particular law if they want it but it's not up to the, the supreme court they said a lot of other things that was very very interesting but um for the purposes of this <laughs> of of this uh program We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, and so some, one of the, the, in the, within the dissent, which means the, the justices that disagreed with the majority opinion, they stated that the constitution does not freeze for all time, for all time, the original view of what those rights guarantee or how they apply. Going back to the historical view, right? We don't just freeze time based on what we believe the um, 
drafters of the constitution believes. We kind of move with the times, um, you know, as we move along years go by, decade, decades go by, you realize that certain things just weren't considered back in 1787, right? And so some of the, the considerations that I jotted down was the position of a woman in 1787, right? They were not, they just simply were not considered. Um, other ethical considerations we talked about is the right to liberty and the state control over a woman. That's essentially what we're looking at. The state controlling what a woman can do with her body. Um, the enforcement of anti-abortion laws. How is that enforced in, in different states? Again, we still have some concerns that there are some big uh, laws out there that apply to medical professionals unfairly and medical professionals are having a hard time um, adjusting with what the law say, says, okay? And the right to travel. Um, and again, my uh, my attorney colleague on the panel will talk a little bit more about some of those other considerations. Where are we now? Um, so I also have the map. It's a very important map. Um, it just kind of shows the breakdown of which states have anti-abortion laws, which states are most restrictive, which are which states are most protective. One of the things I wanted to point out, there seems to be only one state on here that is the most protective state. And that is because that, that state, um, it, Colorado, it really doesn't have a limitation, right? It doesn't have a gestational limitation um, on, on abortion, uh, but, we fall into a protective state class. And some of the reasons why is because we have a limitation on who can get an abortion like minors, although minors have um, some, some exceptions can be made for minors. And I feel like we have some liberal exceptions that can be made for minors. Um, if you can't get in touch with the parent, things like that, you can still perform the abortion on a minor so long as the minor is, um, is uh, shows that they they understand what it is that they're doing and, and their decision making. You can still perform an abortion on a, a minor, but we do have some limitations in Maryland. But we still are in the protective um, realm. Um, in 2024, the Maryland will vote on a referendum for the Declaration of Rights, the right to reproductive freedom, um, establishing that every person as a central component of an individual's right to liberty and, equal, and equal, <laughs> equality, Lord, I can't read, has the fundamental right to reproductive freedom and prohibiting the state from directly or indirectly denying, burdening, or abridging the right unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. And so that will be up for grabs um, in 2024. And so of course, there will be a lot of organizations, of course, um, trying to push for this to pass um, through for um, toward the Maryland State Constitution, okay? Bill Ferguson states, this is a surreal moment in time. And so it's important that Maryland stands firm and show that we are a state where we believe that reproductive health, freedom, and liberty matter and are protected. And so we need to take the steps that are necessary to do that. And so we will. Some other um, acts that actually just passed this year, 2023, uh, Reproductive Health Protection Act prohibiting a judge from requiring a person to give certain testimony or statements or to produce evidence for a case involving an alleged violation of the criminal law of another state relating to health care that is legally protected in the state, right? So if a medical professional performs an abortion here in Maryland, um, this would um, protect the medical professional from being subpoenaed in another state. 
So when a patient comes in from a different state, this is something that will protect that um, medical professional. The health, reproductive health services, protected information and insurance requirements. Um, this also helps protect the medical profession, but it helps protect the record keeping um, mechanisms uh, within the, the medical profession. R within the medical profession, as you know, a lot of um, information is stored electronically and it can be accessed. Um, and so this will assist in those efforts. Uh, public senior higher education institutions, reproductive health services plan. This will allow people who are in higher education for that institution to provide uh, contrac contraception and abortion services. Okay, so that allows for the um, schools in higher ed, Morgan State University, among others, to have those services available for their students. And I wanted to just kind of point this out because we sometimes seem to think that although um, you work in Maryland, our medical professionals may work in Maryland, that they may be um, required to perform some of these services. And so I just kind of wanted to point out the Maryland's conscious clause, which allows medical professionals to sort of opt out um, and, and not perform those services. Um, so a person may not be required to perform or participate um, in an abortion if you, if you did not want to. Okay, so that protects you in that way if you, um, if you don't agree morally, ethically. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to point out where protecting the patient and third parties um, may apply, right? We have the patient coming in from a different state. We have individuals coming in, maybe assisting that patient um, from a different state. And so this, I thought, was very important. Justice Kavanaugh, in his um, opinion, now, Justice Kavanaugh was in the majority opinion, but within his majority opinion, he made a statement that stated, um, if a state bar a residence of that state from traveling to another state to obtain an abortion, in Justice Kavanaugh's view, the answer is no, based on the constitutional right for interstate travel. And may a state retroactively impose liability or punishment for an abortion, that occurred before these um, before Dobbs takes effect. In his view, the answer is no, based on the due process clause or ex post facto clause. So I thought that was very important because we might see some of that happening um, in the future, where a state may attempt to um, regulate an individual's right to travel to get an abortion, and we know here that Justice Kavanaugh, from the majority opinion, will um, certainly decide that that is um, unconstitutional to, uh, to enforce any laws on a person just simply for traveling to a different state. Um, I just have a source slide and that is it. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Wow, I definitely have a question for you at the end. Okay. <laughs> Is telehealth travel? <laughs> oh, yes. I, I believe so we'll, we'll go get to, the to that information. That <laughs> um, yes. And you know what they say that the dissenting opinions of today are the majority opinions of tomorrow. Yep. So here we go. All right. Our third panelist is Dr. Stephen Ralston. His talk is entitled Abortion Care in Maryland, Where Are the Obligations to Those Outside Our State? Stephen J. Ralston, MD, MPH, is a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist currently serving as Division Director, Maternal Fetal Medicine, George Washington University Hospital, and board member, Planned Parenthood of Maryland. Dr. Ralston has been a high-risk pregnancy specialist for over 25 years, with clinical interests, including a full range of maternal and fetal complications. 
His academic interests lie within the realm of medical ethics, especially around issues of pre-viability, prenatal diagnosis, and the treatment of fetal abnormalities. Dr. Olson received his BS in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale College and his MD in medicine from Columbia, Univer or Columbia University. He later received his MPH in health law, bioethics, and human rights from Boston University. Dr. Olson built and strengthened clinical maternal fetal medicine programs in both tertiary centers and community hospitals. He was co-director of the New England Center for Placental Disorders and headed a multidisciplinary team to streamline evaluation and treatment services for women with abnormal placentation. And with that, I'm excited and anxious to hear Dr. Ralston. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritter. That was a very kind introduction. And um, Dr. Banfield, I wanna welcome you to Maryland. It's nice to have you here. Um, let me see if I can share my screen as fastly as everybody else did. Are you seeing my slides? Yeah. Wonderful. So it's uh, really uh, an honor to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, I was asked to speak a little bit about the um, ethical implications of, of being in a sanctuary state. And I, I think our the previous panelists have talked pretty clearly about sort of what, why abortion might be an ethical um, um, practice and why and how we got to where we are. I wanna take a slightly different um, uh, bend on the, the topic and talk about what this means for those of us who are practicing abortion in the state of Maryland now, and what our obligations to patients who are coming to us from other states might be. Um, I do have some disclosures. Um, if you haven't figured it out, I am, I am pro-choice and I am a board member of Planned Parenthood here in Maryland, as, what, as well as a former board member of Planned Parenthood in Massachusetts, which is where I was um, several jobs ago. Um, I was also a member of the ACOG Committee on Ethics and the ACOG Committee on Genetics. And ACOG is the American College of OBGYN. This is um, a pro-choice organization that represents um, OBGYN professionals throughout the country. And I'm, I'm an abortion provider here in the state of Maryland. Um, I will show the same map that everybody else has shown. Um, thank you to the Guttmacher Institute for this map. Um, I put it up here so you can all see where Maryland sits. I'm sort of surrounded by states that are more restricted. Now, you would think that that would mean that Maryland would have led to a huge influx of patients um, coming for abortion care. Um, that hasn't been entirely true. Um, certainly from West Virginia, we've been seeing patients, but that's been true um, for a while. There have been restrictions in, in West Virginia, not many providers. Um, but really patients from the South have other places that they can go to before they reach Maryland. So we haven't seen that huge influx um, in Maryland yet. Although we are definitely seeing patients both at the University of Maryland where I, where I used to practice at Planned Parenthood um, at, and at the abortion clinic where I practice medicine right now, which is Whole Women's Health in Parkville. So, but to be very clear, it is not new that there are abortion restrictions um, since um, the fall of Roe um, two years ago. Um, even before Roe was overturned, there were many states where it was very difficult for women to get pregnant, for women to get um, pregnancy terminations for a variety of reasons. Um, one reason that there just weren't any providers in those states, that there are very few providers, and so getting access to a clinic that could provide abortion was difficult. Um, many states had gestational age restrictions. Um, there were various laws that made it difficult for people to be abortion providers, and so there were fewer abortion providers in some states. And there were some states that had restrictions based on indication, um, primarily Down syndrome and gender selection. So it's not like we were living in a country without abortion restrictions before Dobbs, um, but certainly those restrictions have become much more widespread since Dobbs. Um, and also just, I put up another map here in the United States. This is just showing the, the states where there is Medicaid funding for abortion. Maryland is one of those states, but you can see that the vast majority of states um, in the union do not provide funding for abortion through Medicaid services. And so women who are on Medicaid in those states need to find other sources of funding for their abortion care if they can even find access to care in their states or to go out of state. And of course, if you go out of state for your abortion, then Medicaid doesn't work anyway. You have to pay out of pocket. Um, 
So what are our obligations as individual providers? Um, I, I gather that the vast majority of people on this phone call are not OBGYNs and the vast majority are not abortion providers. Um, so even before um, Dobbs, um, there were certainly patients that we could turn away or refer elsewhere and it would still be considered ethical. Certainly patients who couldn't be safely cared for in our clinics or in our institutions um, could be turned away or referred elsewhere. Um, certainly patients who were asking for illegal services. Remember, even in Maryland, not all abortions are legal. In Maryland, abortions are legal up until viability, but after viability, there has to be um, a serious genetic or structural abnormality in the fetus or the woman's life has to be threatened. So there are illegal abortions um, in, in Maryland that could take place. And so if a woman's coming to us and asking for an illegal service, we can turn her away for that. And I think that we can all agree that that would be ethically justified. Um, and certainly if a patient can't pay for her services, I think that um, we have concluded, at least in this country, that it's okay to turn patients away who can't um, pay. Now, we can make I think very good arguments about why that's not a good ethical stance, but that certainly is what we are doing now. And um, ACOG would support that, AMA would support that, and I think the Maryland Medical Society would be would support that. Um, luckily, there are ways that women can find um, um, funding for their abortions if they can't pay, um, but certainly we have been turning patients away for a while. And now there are other threats to providers. There are threats for our licensure, threats of torts and lawsuits, threats from criminal or felony prosecution. And although Maryland does have shield laws, it is always in the back of our heads, you know, could some a district attorney from some red state come after us for performing an abortion on a resident of their state? Certainly the Texas, um, SB8 law, which passed um, over two years ago now, um, uh, allowed people to sue physicians who were providing abortion care. And, and that um, is something that might cross state lines. And so there are those concerns for those of us who are um, performing abortions. And for some care, we are trying to be very careful. So for example, when we're performing medication abortion in, in the clinics that I work in, um, we give the pills in the clinic and the second pill that the patients have to take a few hours later or a few days later, we tell them that they should do that while they are still in the state of Maryland because we don't want them to be doing something that would be illegal in their own state um, because we worry that that might come back to haunt us. So what do we say to, to providers then, physicians, nurse practitioners who might be performing abortions um, about these threats and whether or not they should um, allow their practice to be affected by those threats. Well, I think if the threat were credible and large, I, I don't think that we could ask providers to, to still do this, to take care of patients who are coming from other states if the threat to the, their licensure or lawsuits was very large and credible. But if it's just a theoretical risk and not very large, then Perhaps we as abortion providers and we as abortion um, uh, clinics have obligations beyond um, those uh, patients who are just in our state um, because we've put up our signs saying we will take care of women who want to end their pregnancies. Perhaps we should be obligated to take care of any woman who, who crosses our threshold. And perhaps because we've chosen to do this particular work, we have particular obligations to do that. Just like you have particular obligations to take care of all patients in an emergency if you put up a sign saying that you're in an emergency room, not just those patients that you want to choose from. Um, Katie Johnson's a lawyer um, in Chicago who wrote this um, essay in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in it, she says that people who are practicing in states that where abortion is restricted should do everything in their power to interpret those restrictions as liberally as possible to allow patients to get access in their state. Um, I'm not sure what she would say to us in a sanctuary state, but I suspect that what she would say is that we should also do everything within our power to allow women to have access to care in our states. So that's sort of how I parse out the ethical obligations of individual providers. But I also wanna talk a little bit about institutions because institutions are often the gatekeepers for um, many kinds of care, including abortion care. And 
So what is the obligation of Johns Hopkins or the University of Maryland or MedStar um, when patients come from out of states? And as I stated, for emergency care, you have to take care of patients. If, I, if, a, if a Texan woman comes to the emergency room and she's having a heart attack, that emergency room has to take care of that patient, even if she's from Texas, even if she has no money, even if she has no insurance. And that's federal law, that Santel, which I'm sure everybody in this phone call is familiar with. Um, and institutions commonly see patients from other localities, sometimes um, um, advertising to treat patients from other localities. They become a center for cardiothoracic surgery or oncology or orthopedic care. And so they're very happy when patients come from out of state. And so I think we can make a good justice-based argument that if you're going to treat patients from other states for some kinds of medical problems, you should also treat patients from other states who are seeking abortion care. We should treat similarly situated things equally. And that's a, a justice-based argument to say that, you know, institutions should be opening their doors to these patients. But I will say that many institutions will make an argument that, well, you know, abortion is different. Abortion is not cardiothoracic surgery, it's not medical oncology, it's not orthopedics, it's not these other things where patients are coming to our institutions. It's different because it's controversial, it's a public relations nightmare for these institutions, and maybe even a donor relations nightmare. And it may be that patients seeking abortions at their institutions are going to make demands on the system that prevent other patients from receiving needed med care. So if your operating rooms are being filled up with patients who are seeking abortion care, then you're not going to be able to use those operating rooms for patients who need orthopedic surgery or cardiothoracic surgery, much more remunerative um, care, I might add. So the other side of that argument is that we should not treat abortion differently, that um, treating abortion differently from other healthcare services is how we got into this quandary to begin with, because we are allowing some states to outlaw this one particular um, uh, medical procedure. Um, and I would argue that patients seeking abortion care are not likely to overlap current structures and systems. Certainly most abortions are not taking place in big institutions. It's really only the sickest patients, the patients who are furthest along, the patients who have many comorbidities that are, that are necessitating them having their care in um, an institution like the University of Maryland or, or Johns Hopkins. Um, and there are even examples where when abortion um, uh, access has been a problem, um, that institutions can come together and solve that problem. So when I was practicing in Boston in the late 1990s, um, there was um, a, a, a single abortion provider who was doing probably 50% of the late second trimester terminations in Boston. And he stopped practicing and suddenly there was a void and we needed to find ways to take care of these patients. And the major institutions in Boston got together and decided to form a compact essentially saying that they would all take care of these patients and that we would divvy them up amongst the major institutions so that one institution would not be burdened more than another. So I think there's examples in the past of institutions taking on this responsibility. And I would say that large institutions are better suited to make clear policies and statements that this is in fact healthcare. Abortion is essential health healthcare that all patients deserve access to and that we as a large institution are gonna make sure um, that we are part of that solution for any patient regardless of where they're coming from. And maybe even especially when they are coming from places where um, access has been curtailed. So uh, all that is to say that I think that um, treating abortion differently, um, this abortion exceptionalism is something we should end, that we should treat abortion just like every other kind of healthcare um, that is out there and we should be making it um, available to patients. So in conclusion, um, I think both providers and uh, individual providers and institutions have obligations um, to pregnant people seeking abortion services. I do think all providers have an obligation to ensure that their states and institutions will protect access um, to this necessary care. And I hope that not the OBGYNs on this call, really the non-OBGYNs on this call um, will come away from this series of talks um, and um, uh, be, be advocates for this kind of care. Um, and so I think we all have obligations to ensure that our states and institutions will protect providers who are on the front lines because we are putting ourselves at risk, not just from you know, the crazies who might shoot at us, but from the, from the legal risks out there. Um, 
And then maybe, in fact, I do believe that abortion providers have special obligations to patients seeking abortion care from other states. And I'll, I'll just end with these um, uh, three little um, boxes just showing you that um, states where abortion um, is restricted, states that make abortion difficult to access are states that have higher maternal mortality rates. And this is uh, an issue about pregnant people. This is an issue about poor people. This is an issue for black people. Um, and so, um, and that's where I'll end. And I am I know I'm gonna have some questions. So I'm really happy to take them at the end. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I like those ideas about the institution and we will talk more about that in the, in the discussion. Um, so let's to get to our final, save the best for last, right? And Leah, Michael then. Right. Uh, she is a uh, JD MPP, Masters of Public Policy. Analia Michaelman is a senior attorney in uh, the American Medical Association Advocacy Resource Center, where she works directly with national, state, and specialty medical societies to enact state laws and regulations that enhance the practice of medicine. Attorney Michael Men joined the AMA in 2014 and specializes in Medicaid, public health and safety, health disparities, and state budget issues. Prior to joining the AMA, Ms. Michaelman was a health policy specialist with the National Alliance to Advance Adolescent Health in Washington, D.C., where she conducted research on federal Medicaid policy and behavioral health programs. Ms. Michaelman received Juris Doctorate and a Master's in Public Policy from Georgetown University, an undergraduate degree in Political Science from James Madison University. Prior to attending graduate and law school, Attorney Michaelman worked on state legislative, congressional, and gubernatorial campaigns in Virginia as a political campaign fundraiser. She is here today as one of our AMA legal liaisons to help us more fully understand the reproductive health laws over the past year. So, so thank you you're so on. much for having me. Let me share my screen. Is that working for you? Can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. So, um, as it says in my bio, I do state advocacy for the AMA. Um, my portfolio is pretty large. I handle a lot of things. Um, in the past year, though, it has come to include almost exclusively reproductive health and abortion laws. Um, this has taken over a lot of the work that um, I do at the state level um, for the AMA. So I'm going to talk about the landscape of abortion laws and the policy issues that those laws raise. Coming from the AMA, I'm bringing a national perspective to this and I'm gonna highlight some things that other states have done. Um, I certainly have knowledge of, this, of the laws in Maryland, but would not consider myself an expert in Maryland law. So, why is that not advancing? Here we go, okay. So I have a map as well. Um, Guttmacher is wonderful, but I did not take their map. <laughs> I have my own map. Um, with slightly more detailed information. Um, I track this very closely. Um, in the 15 or so months that it that have happened uh, since the Dobbs decision, um, abortion is now severely restricted in exactly half the states. So as you can see on the slide, um, as of today, 14 states have banned all abortion from conception on. Two states, Georgia and South Carolina, um, have a ban after fetal cardiac activity is detected, so about six weeks. Um, and then nine others ban abortion later in pregnancy, but before 22 weeks. Um, this map here is what is in effect right now. Um, many of these states have other bans on the books, some of them conflicting, um, that are not in effect. But this, this is what the map looks like right now. So I want to give you a look into the issues um, facing states like Maryland. I'm not going to go into the problems and complications facing the physicians in those restrictive states. Um, but as you know, this webinar is exploring, Marylanders are not immune from the impact of those laws. 
Um, so I think that the main issues and responses can be broken into two general categories. We have the interstate issues, um, like responding to the possibility of enforcement from other states. And then you have the access and demand issues, responding to the increased number of patients um, that are seeking care in states like Maryland. So first with the possibility of interstate enforcement, telehealth has become a critical way to ensure access to abortion care. And since physicians in Maryland are potentially interacting with patients via telehealth, I wanna give you a brief look into the factors um, that need to be considered um, when you're treating patients from other states. Um, first, it's really important to remember that the applicable law is the one where the patient is located not where the provider is. And so that means also at the time that the care is provided. So patients who travel to Maryland and are seen in Maryland, Maryland law applies. But patients who live in another state and who are seen via telehealth, perhaps sitting in their living room in their home, then their home state law applies. And that includes licensure. You do have to be licensed in the state where the patient is located. I think it's also really important to think about the differences in activities and services provided. Um, the risk of running afoul of another state's law is probably minimal if all services begin and end in the access state, meaning counseling about options, prescribing or performing the procedure, and, and whenever that may terminate. But the risk may be higher if any of those elements occur in a banned state. So if, for instance, the patient-physician relationship is established via telehealth while the patient is still in their band state, um, or if the patient self-administers medication after returning home to their band state, that might raise your risk. And if the patient is in a band state, then there needs to be an understanding and compliance with that state's laws. So I could spend an entire hour on what gets caught up in an abortion ban and what doesn't, how the exceptions apply. It's really complicated, 15 months after Dobbs, and we still don't know. And that's why we've seen so many media reports of women who have had complications during their pregnancy, they need care, termination is clearly indicated, um, but the hospital or the physicians don't know whether they can do that. And so care gets delayed. It is because those laws are so vague and confusing um, and frankly don't reflect the realities of medical practice. So it is really hard to determine what is permissible and what isn't. Um, also, as um, indicated in the last presentation, there's also a lot of other laws surrounding abortion. It is not just the ban. There might be waiting periods, ultrasound, requirements, there's a lot of reporting requirements. Um, so those need to be complied with as well. And then there's some additional consideration for telehealth. Again, the governing law is determined by the location of the patient. A number of states prohibit telehealth abortion entirely. So you need to know that. Um, but then there's also those other telehealth general requirements that you're gonna need to know um, that would apply to any other kind of care as well. And then sometimes there's additional rules for prescribing and dispensing with medication abortions specifically. I can't tell you exactly what the risk is in any given encounter. Um, certainly consult an attorney if you have very specific questions, but I do want you to kind of understand all of the different factors and the considerations that have to go into this calculation. So that risk of enforcement brings us to shield laws. Generally speaking, states have jurisdiction over the practice of medicine in their state, and their authority stops at the state line. But there's a lot that is unknown and untested when it comes to abortion bans. And to be clear, we are not aware of any enforcement actions taken against a physician for providing abortion care yet, let alone any enforcement action across state lines. But the concern and the confusion that I hear from physicians is very real. So shield laws are the access state response to concerns about abortion bans having reach across state lines. They are, as of last year, a new idea, very novel. So far enacted in 17 states in DC, including, as you know, Maryland. And across those states, we've seen shield law protections fall into some common buckets. 
Um, the ones that you see on the slide are the features that are also in Maryland's law. So the first bucket is essentially using state government to prevent or thwart other states' actions, civil or criminal. So that means prohibiting state courts from issuing subpoenas from other states if they are related to abortion care or prohibiting enforcement of out-of-state judgments, those sorts of things. Shield laws also often prohibit the medical board from taking disciplinary action based on out-of-state activity that would have otherwise been lawful in the state. Um, they often also uh, prohibit reciprocal disciplinary action. So if you were to be disciplined, if you were uh, licensed in multiple states, disciplined for providing abortion care in a restrictive state, um, oftentimes, you know, if you get in trouble in one state, it carries over to the others, right? Um, so sometimes these shield laws prohibit that sort of reciprocal action. And then the third bucket relates to malpractice insurance prohibiting insurers from, say, denying coverage or raising rates based off of um, abortion-related activity or litigation um, in another state. Some other states have extended this idea to other entities. So Illinois, for example, now prohibits institutions like hospitals from taking an adverse action against a provider for activity that is protected in Illinois. Another example is in Colorado. Their law prohibits adverse actions by health insurers such as terminating somebody from a provider network because they are an abortion provider. Um, another feature of shield laws that we see a lot is authorizing a new civil action, um, a kind of countersuit, a claim by somebody in the protective state against someone else who has sued them or taken some sort of action against them. Um, and the basis of that claim is, is basically the unlawful interference with the protected right to um, obtain or provide medical care. Um, these laws are very important um, and very popular in states um, like Maryland that want to protect access to abortion. The AMA absolutely supports legal protections for abortion providers. But I think understanding the limitations here is just as important as understanding their protections. So let me go through a couple of those things. First, shield law protections apply only to the activities that are specified in the law. So only certain kinds of care, usually abortion related or reproductive health related activity. Some states have extended this to gender affirming care as well. Shield laws also only protect actions that are otherwise legal and permissible in the state. So you have to meet all of the medical board's rules, have to be licensed, all scope of practice rules, have to be followed for our non-physician colleagues. Um, this does not protect, say, malpractice. Um, also understand that these protections do not follow somebody when they leave the state. So if you are facing some sort of action in another state, you're protected in Maryland, but if you leave the state of Maryland, these laws will not protect you, even if you are, say, traveling through. It's also really important, and I think this is the most important one. I want to emphasize that these legal protections are entirely untested. It is a very novel idea. They have been enacted on legitimate concerns about extraterritorial enforcement, but we have not actually seen any extraterritorial, extraterritorial enforcement yet. So we don't really know if shield laws are going to do what we hope they will do. Um, there's a number of other interstate issues that I could address, but for time's sake, I'm not going to get into. Data privacy is one of them. Payment issues when providing care across state lines is another one. Um, but I'm going to move on to um, some access issues. Because other than dealing with the threat of interstate enforcement, the other major bucket um, that I see access states having to contend with is the increase in patient load because travel is now a standard part of abortion care in half of the country. So states like Maryland are having to absorb the influx of patients traveling from restrictive states or traveling via telehealth, effectively. Um, I don't know the specific numbers for Maryland, but elsewhere providers of abortion care in access states are reporting triple digit increases in the number of patients that they are seeing. So obviously that is causing a big strain on resources Abortion providers are also reporting that the patients that visit them from out of state are often more complex cases, probably because the patient has had to travel. They've had to make, arrangement, make arrangements to travel 
they've had to had to find the resources resources to do that, and so sometimes they present later later in pregnancy. So not only are there more patients, but the patients are requiring more time and resources once they get the care that they need. And so in response, states have looked at additional support and financial assistance for clinics and patients. Maryland is one of those states. Um, this is things like committing funding to supporting repro health services and infrastructure, increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates, and in some cases, direct payments to clinics that have a high patient load. We're also seeing a lot of bills from access states, a lot of legislation to fund training programs to shore up the workforce. Um, by and large, this has been focused on expanding training for non-physician providers though. Um, availability of medication. So mifepristone, there is a lot of litigation surrounding mifepristone. The bottom line is that for now, it's status quo. But the future availability of mifepristone is very much up in the air. There are a few court cases, um, including one that the state of Maryland is involved in. I think the most notable one is out of Texas, where a small group of doctors have challenged FDA's approval of mifepristone, as well as the conditions FDA has set for dispensing it, so the REMS that go along with mifepristone. The litigation is ongoing um, and the Supreme Court has blocked any changes for the time being, but the latest development was that an appeals court decision has preserved the original approval of mifepristone, so that's good, um, but they are they have permitted invalidating the recent changes to the REMS. So there were changes made in 2016 and 2021 um, that among some other things allowed mifepristone to be prescribed via telemedicine and dispensed via the mail. So at the moment, access to medication abortion and mifepristone specifically is unchanged. But depending on what the Supreme Court does, we could revert to pre-2016 dispensing rules that would bar mifepristone via telehealth. I understand that MIFI isn't the only drug available, so telemedicine would not be entirely inaccessible, but it's still obviously very problematic. Um, and I could probably talk for another hour about the, the problem with civil and civil challenges to um, uh, FDA approval of drugs generally. Um, we've also seen, I should note, a couple states start to make plans to ensure continued access to medication if mifepristone becomes inaccessible. Um, I don't know how successful that will be, but we've seen some states at least try to make some plans. Um, one other thing I wanna to touch on is medical education. We have not seen a lot of legislation on this, but I know that it is definitely a challenge for access states. So as many of you are probably aware, OBGYN residents are required for ACGME accreditation requirements to learn abortion procedures. And they cannot do that in half the states. They have to learn it, they can't do it at their home institution. So the programs in the banned states have to send those trainees to access states like Maryland. Um, and we hear that that is a major strain on the system in the access states and for the banned states. Um, but the institutions in the access states have to absorb that increase, handle all of the logistics, which is very complicated, while also making sure that they are taking care of their own trainees. So to end on a kind of positive note, um, access states are also doing a lot to ensure that people maintain meaningful access to care. That means often establishing or reaffirming a statutory or constitutional right to reproductive care, as Maryland is in the process of doing. We're also seeing a lot of bills to expand Medicaid coverage for abortion services and to prohibit private cost sharing, um, or cost sharing in private plans, I should say. Um, a few states have also funded public outreach programs to ensure that people know abortion services are available and how to get them. So for instance, Massachusetts and Oregon, and I think a couple other states, have established hotlines that people can call with legal questions um, or for help finding care. So I know I'm out of time. It's just to sum up, there are a lot of policy and legal implications, even in states where abortion remains legal or the abortion laws have not changed. But there is still, even a year later, can, a considerable amount of uncertainty to contend with. Um, all right, I know that that was probably a lot of information. I am happy to take any questions that you all may have. Yes, a lot of information indeed. That is uh, 
constantly changing in real time. So this is the question and answer part. If any of the participants uh, wanna raise your hand, ask a question, uh, feel free to do that. Or if you have a question, put it in the chat. Um, I know, uh, Debbie, this was to 7.30, but you know, is it okay if we go longer with the questions? I would, I would think oh, maybe yeah. we could, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, there, there is a hand raised. Uh, it says Meg Fairfax Fielding, oh. <laughs> but you don't look like a nope. Meg, but maybe you are a Meg. Uh, so can you announce who you are? Yes, yes. Oh. Well, I'm Dr. Henry Farkas. Okay. Um, I've had this ever since it, in Texas, they passed that law that says that any doctor can be sued no matter where they are if they uh, even talk about abortions to somebody from Texas. I had this vision. Yeah, here I am in Maryland, but I have a daughter in Los Angeles, and sometimes I like to drive across the country and visit. I'm not an abortion provider, so it, it actually wouldn't apply to me, but if an abortion provider was passing through Texas and a Texas state trooper read their license plate and found out that their name was on a list of people. Could they arrest them because they're in Texas and they would be subject to that law while they were not in Maryland? So I can, I can take this one. We haven't seen a lot of those cases, rather surprisingly. So we don't really know how they are going to end up. But an important limitation to the SB8 in Texas is that the civil action is out of aiding and abetting an illegal abortion in the state of Texas. So if you are in Texas providing abortions that are illegal, that don't meet any of the and any of the exceptions, then there's a risk of civil liability for that. But it does not capture if a Texas resident travels to Maryland and receives abortion care in Maryland. There's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Bruce, Bruce Hirschfeld. You raise your hand, you have a question. Yes. Can you hear me okay? We can. Good. My understanding is that certain rights that I acquired under the Constitution and responsibilities like registering for the draft started on my birthday, my 18th birthday in that case, I'm going to be 25, to be a representative, 30 to be a senator, 35 to be president, vice president. When did those begin? Did they, did they begin on my birthday or did they begin in some undetermined time when I was in my mother's womb? How do you start the timeline? We're talking about rights and responsibilities. When do they begin? Uh, yeah, I think what you're getting at is the, the idea of personhood, of fetal okay. personhood. Yes. Um, which a, a couple states have passed fetal personhood bills. Mm -hmm. There's actually some litigation to trying to establish that um, in Texas and in Georgia. Um, very good question. <laughs> um, we hear a lot about that. So yeah, the when does life begin question. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a, uh, a question that I don't think any one of us can ever answer. But the, the questions around these uh, laws now are uh, what we have to deal with, with as physicians and working within the field. Uh, personally, I have a license to practice in Wisconsin and uh, I'm going back to my 40th year medical school class reunion. Oh boy, I could just see you know them lining up outside of um, Medical College of Wisconsin. Like here's all the doctors, right? OBGYNs. But now uh, as of this week, they ruled a, a rule of uh, a judge ruled that abortion was not part of the 1849 law, so I can go back to my home state comfortably now without having to worry about being uh, thrown in jail in the middle of my medical school class reunion. I mean, there's are things that's ridiculous we think about though. I mean, but um, actually, I want to I go want to go back to the telehealth because you know more more and more of these abortions are being done medically and not surgically. I mean, in Europe, they they do, they do like 90% uh, medical abortions. We're here, I think it's more like 50-50 now. So the surger, surgery ones, your personhood is in the state, but where's the person? And uh, now that the 
uh, institutions are allowed and pharmacies are allowed to dispense mifepristone. Um, so we didn't talk about about the institutions of pharmacies. We talked about the institutions of hospitals and um, whatever institutions Dr. Um, Ralston was talking about. But um, can you kind of uh, elucidate where we're going to go with that? And I, I want to address this to Attorney Kesh because you were the one that put it in my head when Kavanaugh said that this doesn't apply to travel. So we are a very mobile society. We have uh, we work in different states. We get on an airplane and go here, and then we go back here. And you know, uh, I have two different locations that I, I live in. So where what does this travel and telehealth look like? And is it uh, access for us to uh, fight this law with Kavanaugh's blessing? I think the biggest thing here would be um, the definition of practice of medicine in that particular state. So we know that um, all uh, those who practice medicine in Maryland must be licensed in Maryland in order to practice, right? And so when you are dealing with a patient who is telehealth, you have to consider the place in which that patient is situated at the time. Because if you are practicing, if you are um, engaging with a patient who is, let's say in West Virginia, through telehealth, that may be considered practicing Maryland in West Virginia because the patient is in West Virginia. Um, and so then you are subject to the laws of West Virginia and unable to, um, more than likely, unable to practice medicine there, right? And so you definitely have to consider where the patient is when the patient is um, communicating with you via telehealth. Um, and so that's one of, that is one of the great issues. Um, and one of the other issues we, we talked about, what is it, two pills? If you take one in Maryland <laughs> and one in a, another state, I do believe that it still protects the medical professional because that medical professional um, diagnosed in the state of Maryland as opposed to wherever that patient went and traveled to. And most laws are affecting the medical professional and not the patient. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're in that state, when you practice medicine, you should be okay. But as um, Michelle Man, Michael Man, I, I heard it and I still Michael said Man. it wrong. <laughs> Michael Man, yes. As Michael Man um, pointed out, there hasn't been a test of some of those shield laws yet. Um, but I do believe that we would be okay, even if you think about uh, the right to contract, right, where the contract was created, that medical, um, that medical contract was created in the state of Maryland, and so the state of Maryland laws would apply at that point. So it's a lot of constitutional variations that would go into that, um, but hopefully we don't see something like that anytime soon. Yeah, it's just confusing uh, for me a lot because we do have a federal drug law. We can order, we can order medications in pharmacies in all fifty states, but it's it's how we get the medicine there around the talking about why are we sending mifepristone over there? Because you know it's in it's in hype it's in hyperspace or you know cyberspace. Right. But, so it'll right. be what's the what is the definition of practicing medicine if you if you um, put in a prescription into a different state and that patient picks it up are you practicing me medicine in that different state or are you practicing medicine in still in Maryland? Yeah, we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't been doing. I mean, we all send prescriptions to other states right now. We've been doing that forever. I think it's only since telehealth came up where they're like looking at, oh, you got to have a, a license uh, to practice medicine in that state to send that to that pharmacy there. I mean, those nuances are, have come up since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this this whole um, Dobbs decision is putting a whole nother light onto telehealth, right? From all the other yeah. aspects of medicine, not just OB, but Miffy Pristone puts it right at the tip of the iceberg here. Yep. I have a, there's a hand raised, Steve. Oh, who's, yeah, who's thanks, but, okay. thanks. Um, um, I, oh, I, I don't I, see I, you on the screen anymore. Oh, there you are. I am here. Um, thank you so much. Um, I um, I had a question for um, the lawyers or the constitutional experts that might be on the phone call. 
Um, as as we're all aware, the uh, Republican um, presidential candidates are all talking about federal abortion bans. And my question is sort of, what can you just sort of like walk me through what that would look like for us in Maryland? Um, will these um, federal bans preempt any of our state laws or would there then be constitutional challenges because of the, uh, is it the 10th amendment? I can't even remember what it is, but um, if you could help me there. So um, I, there would be challenges to that kind of law, to a federal law, um, because the practice of medicine is general, is reserved for the states. It's an exercise of the state police power. Um, but the federal government has uh, authority to um, regulate interstate commerce. Um, I think that they would probably craft that law so that it was focused on interstate commerce and uh, not so much the authority of states to regulate the practice of medicine. But we, we really don't know. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm trying to go through the chat. Um, Debbie, have you look, seen any? Is there? I, I know Scott Hageman has a question. Scott, are you willing to raise your hand and speak to your question? <laughs> Great. Scott, sure. Dr. Sure. Hageman. Sure. Some of us actually um, are physicians in other countries. That is, we go to other countries and deliver physician care in other countries. So I'm wondering if while we're in other countries or perhaps other physicians in other countries deliver telehealth services back into the United States, let's say Texas, and um, have medication shipped into Texas from another country, would that uh, be problematical? I'd, similarly problematical as if we were delivering those services from within Maryland, even though we're not within Maryland at the time, or another physician who does not at all practice in the United States? Yes. So if you are in another country practicing via telehealth, reaching a patient in Texas, Texas laws apply to that situation. And so that physician should be following the laws of Texas. Now, what Texas can do about that I don't, probably not a whole lot. Um, and there are some companies that are based in other countries um, that are mailing abortion medication for exactly that reason, because there's there's not much that Texas can do about it. Okay, thank you. And um, Dr. Dr. Wolf, uh, your question, are we to use, uh, no, what was your question? <laughs> Can about you... Express Scripts? Oh, yes. Express Scripts, uh, mail orders. Um, I'm not sure if they're going through the REMS, and I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but the risk evaluation mitigation strategy that you have to go through in order to be a prescriber, pharmacies have to do that too. I don't know if mail orders have done that. Does anybody? I mean, I don't know. I don't even know if all the hospitals in Maryland have Mifepristone on the formulary. In fact, I know one that doesn't, one that I work at doesn't. So, I mean, where is the institutional uh, responsibility for that? I mean, so there was a, the, Mar the Maryland Board of Public Works just approved a $1.3 million emergency purchase of 2.5 years of Mifepristone and the Maryland Department of Health is stockpiling Mifepristone right now. This is this week. So yeah, we got a problem <laughs> and it's just going to um, explode like a volcano on us. So, it's very, uh, all of you who didn't go into OBGYN, I bet you really wanted to go into it now, right? <laughs> but actually I wanna to ask Dr. Banfield, you know, you, when you and I talked, you talked about the effect uh, on uh, non-OBGYNs, if you could uh, just, uh, speak to that uh, again for the non-OBGYNs and how this uh, these bans affect them. So I'm obviously um, fairly involved in ACOG at a national level. And so when the, um, and having been in West Virginia previously, did a lot of 
um, work in, um, in the legislative side of things with people from other similar states um, and how we were all managing these issues and what we were hearing from other people. And one of the things that happened in Texas um, uh, and in some of the other states where there are now, you know, um, regulation on whether or not you can, you know, what is the definition kind of for SBA of aiding and abetting? You know, if you're an oncologist and, you know, I alluded to this earlier, who has a patient who needs to have chemotherapy and they're pregnant, you know, typically you're going to counsel you here, here's the therapeutic option. You know, you could choose to, you know, continue the pregnancy and wait for treatment until afterwards. You could choose to end the pregnancy and here's what that might look like. And this is what that would mean for your treatment. Does that conversation now that you've had with your patient counseling them appropriately on their current cancer diagnosis and all of the appropriate medical options, does that fall under aiding and abetting if that patient then proceeds to get a termination of the pregnancy so they can proceed with their chemotherapy or whatever treatment you may have recommended? If you're a person who is prescribing methotrexate or Depakote or some of these other medications that we know can be teratogenic or even uh, fetotoxic, are you now when you prescribe that medication, if the patient is pregnant and you don't know, and the methotrexate causes them to end their pregnancy, have you now abetted someone in, you know, um, having an illegal abortion in the state of Texas because of that situation? Or have you, um, you know, when you counsel the Depakote patient who now discovers that they have a pregnancy um, with a lethal anomaly or with an anomaly that is maybe not lethal, which is probably a worse situation actually, because there are some of those exceptions. You know, if you now counsel that patient appropriately and they choose to move forward with an abortion, have you again, you know, aided and abetted. And so that's where we have seen um, in some of these states that have these more unusual sort of ways that they were trying to restrict access that other specialties were being more impacted in ways that people hadn't thought about before. You just didn't think about it until it became the possibility, right? Because I don't know if any of us ever thought that, that the laws governing the practice of medicine would become so creative, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that a lot of us never considered. And so you don't you don't think about it because you're thinking about here are the steps that I need to take to provide my patient with the most appropriate care in this situation. You don't think about like, could this somehow be construed as X, Y, or Z thing? So um, that's one of the things that we have seen um, that ACOG has seen come up um, frequently in different um, in our different states um, as these laws have passed. Dr. Ralston, you want to speak to that too? Yeah, I think that um, Dr. Banfield just made a very strong argument of why we need a constitutional amendment in the state of Maryland, because even though our laws right now are fairly um, uh, supportive and liberal, we don't know what those laws are going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And codifying this in our constitution is one more way of protecting those rights into the future. Um, so I don't want people to just like be very complacent about this constitutional amendment. It is important. And I hope that um, all of us on this call are gonna help um, forward that cause. I wanna right. just comment too that when Dr. Ralston's talking about complacency, I think that many people, perhaps not those of us who were OBGYNs who were doing a lot of advocacy work, but I think many people in medicine were very, and in the general public, were very complacent about Roe. You know, unless you were somebody who was working in the space, like some of our legal advocates or some of our medical advocates, people thought like Roe is Roe, right? Like it's the law of the land. It is enshrined in our, you know, psyche, all of these sorts of things until suddenly it wasn't. And so I think we need to think about that anytime we are making assumptions about what what rights we will have moving forward. Right. And, and, and to that end, you know, um, the AMA um, has one statement about the ethics on abortion. Um, and it's, it was written uh, before, in 1970s. Um, I really would love it if they looked at it and modified it a little bit more. Basically says it's not going to prevent any provider from doing an abortion, uh, but that they should uh, make sure that they are uh, following the laws. So, uh, and they didn't 
specifically state anything else, but the laws of, you know, the states are, um, some of them are very non-scientific. So um, that's when I started this whole conversation is like, we are based on science. I mean, there's a lot of ethics behind this, but the science behind this is really what we have founded our uh, medical standard of care on. So um, we can agree uh, we to be to disagree. Uh, we don't have to be disagreeable about it. I mean, that's why I'm so happy that we're having this conversation. Um, there is a comment that um, one made here that you know that that it was very one-sided conversation tonight, and I um, apologize if you feel that way. But I, I appreciate that you uh, said that because we can work on that to be more inclusive of the people who um, really have a completely different opinion about the ethics of abortion. Uh, so. So I think if they, I think there's one other question out there. Anybody else have their hand up? Um, I hope your answer, uh, Doctor Gitlis, was uh, was answered. That yes, you would be liable if your patient had a miscarriage after you operated on them from the anesthesia, even though it wasn't your intent. We have Doctor Rawlings, Stallings. So, sorry. <laughs> That's oh, pretty bad, that, Carol. With your hand up. <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to comment on, on your on your uh, comment because I think it it would be a wonderful situation if we could have um, dialect flowing both ways and seeing everyone's opinion. But I would be concerned if this conversation were say opposed to it, and one of us were there giving our opinions. You know potentially be shot at this, you know, sh shot, in, you know, as you stand, um, because there's so much, um, the other opinion is a bit so aggressive that they're not interested in hearing anything else that the other side has to say. Um, again, so I think your suggestion is great if, if, if dialect could be had um, cordially, but I just don't see um, well, that. Well, this is a start. <laughs> this, it's a start. I was in a conversation recently and uh, it deteriorated because of um, other views. But again, well, hopefully it's a, mm -hmm. we, we can um, head that in the right direction. I've been yeah. trying, trying to get MedKai to do a, a CME on abortion for 20 years. <laughs> ben, I actually am the one that brought the question up. And I happen to believe in abortion rights. So and where the state is. But I don't think that we even a attempted with the ethics to show, to, to consider what the other side thinks. Before we can have a conversation with them cordially, we need to be willing to consider where they're coming from. And I don't think we did that tonight. Uh, I, we can always work to be better, Dr. Wolf, and we will try. Dr. Alston? Yeah, thanks. Um, and Dr. Wolf, you're absolutely right. This was a one-sided conversation, but I think that's because the topic um, just made the assumption that abortion was ethical because this was how we can deal with legally in the state of Maryland, which is a sanctuary state. I think there, we can have very robust conversations about reproductive um, rights um, uh, within this organization um, and have um, really respectful dialogue about that. But for the purposes of this conversation of sort of what are our ethical obligations when we are already in a sanctuary state, unless you want to make the argument, and we could make that argument that one of our ethical ob obligations is to fight tooth and nail, to overturn all these laws and make, make Maryland as a restrictive state as Texas is. But I don't think that's what what MedKai's purpose was. But you are right, it is one-sided, I think because Maryland is a very one-sided state. Um, but the ethical question of abortion is a very interesting question and I'm happy to talk about that, you know, till the cows come home. Uh, Teresa Healy Conway has her hand up. Yes, and um, I'm a staff, I'm not a clinician, but this is a question for the attorneys. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, we've been complacent with Roe versus Wade being in place. And one of the things that has come up that I've seen in the media is 
in these states, they allegedly have exceptions for the life of the pregnant person. However, it seems unclear who makes that judgment and what that risk has to be. Does she have to be actually dying? Is it a 50-50 chance? Like, is that where, you know, can somebody speak to that where, you know, doctors, you know, allegedly have on the books that there's an exception, but nobody knows how to interpret them? Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, that is where I have spent a majority of my time over the past year's legislative sessions in red states. Um, and that is the question, because the the language usually goes something like an abortion is is permissive, permitted um, when necessary to preserve the life or to prevent um, serious bodily injury or major bodily function or something like that. And it's not it's not in words that doctors understand. Right. That's that's not how you operate. And so, you know, is it. So does somebody have to be 51 percent, <laughs> um, you know, over towards losing their life? Is it 70 percent? Th these are all of the questions. And, and that is why we have heard all of these horror stories about women going to the emergency department in these states. The doctor saying, I know what to do here from a medical standpoint, <clears throat> but I don't know what to do here from a clinical standpoint. And so they have to bring in the hospital lawyers and they decide and care gets delayed. Um, but yeah, the point is, we don't know what those exceptions mean. They are not drafted in a way that allows for, uh, you know, clinical decision making, really. And I just wanted to add, and some, some of the language in some of the states just say, if the health of the mother is, um, you know, at issue, right? There, there's some issue with the health of the mother. And I think, me a mental health issue um, because they don't specify what type of health issue that we are considering in some of these laws. Most of them do actually. Most of them express right. So I've yeah, I've seen that they have just said health, and then there were some states that did identify mental health is not included. Um, but those are just some of the issues that have arisen regarding these exceptions. Thank you. Though, though the time is late, I'm going to have Dr. Banfield and Dr. Ralston um, speak finally, and then uh, we're going to close out with Dr. Rockauer. So Dr. Banfield first. So I'm just going to share that um, this health of the mother situation was, is one of the exceptions in the state of West Virginia. And um, one of the things that made this a very and still makes this a very challenging issue in the state of West Virginia, is one of the maternal fetal medicine specialists who currently practices in the state actually published in one of the state newspapers a an op-ed opinion saying that there is never a situation where the life of the mother could be, uh, would be need, the termination would be necessary to save their life. And so this was actually published in one of the state newspapers in West Virginia. This is a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So this would be somebody who would be considered potentially as an expert should a case ever come in the state of the West of West Virginia where, um, you know, uh, someone's practice was being considered. And, you know, West Virginia also has um, a mechanism within the medical board where it could go to the medical board as well. Um, and so if this physician, you know, if this is the person that the state and or the medical board would choose to use as their quote expert to determine if you fulfilled this requirement of the law, you're kind of out on, on a limb. And so there's a perfect example of why this is such a problem. You don't know who they're going to choose as an expert. There is not a way to know who that's going to be. Um, and, you know, you can find all kinds of interesting opinions in medicine and you can talk them into talking about what they like. Um, so that's my final comment for the evening as someone who came from a state um, that had those sorts of uh, restrictions in place. And Dr. Ralston. Yeah, I just want to um, add on to that, that um, I'm wearing my ethics hat and um, that that is really antithetical to sort of the ethical practice of medicine to make your patient get sicker before you treat her. 
And that is what these laws do. And that, that is what is very, I think, troublesome. Um, the absence of the mental health exception, of course, is a very cynical ploy on the part of the um, uh, anti-choice legislators to um, not allow women who are having mental health problems or who are ending their pregnancies for any kind of emotional reaction to the pregnancy to have access to that care. So it's cynical, it's purposeful, and it's not random that those things are going in. But really the ethical practice of medicine means that we should be preventing bad things from happening in women. And, and, and saying that we have to wait till those bad things happen is just horrible. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. And we should all feel really um, in shock that we are, have allowed legislators to tell us how to practice medicine. Well said, so be it. And yes, it's it's where we are. And I appreciate everyone's comments tonight. And I've learned so much from you all. I hope you all have a better sense of the chaos. <laughs> um, and we're going to end with Dr. Rocco. Well, I just want to thank Dr. Ritter and all of the panelists for this most informative uh, discussion. It's uh, It shows all the the problems uh, relating to everything about abortion and everything going on in our country these days. And this is what ethics is all about, is to discuss all this. Uh, for the Center of Healthy Maryland, uh, we can certainly uh, consider having a uh, point-counterpoint type uh, discussion at some point in the future, and we will look into that. Before we go, I wanna talk about two other things. Uh, this coming Thursday, on oh, I guess it's September 28th, so that's next week, uh, we're having our uh, another lecture in our 45th anniversary of the Physician's Health Plan. Um, September is Physician Suicide Awareness Month. This is another ethical problem and big time problem relating to physicians, and we're having a lecture by Dr. Jill Parker V. Friedman uh, to talk about uh, problems of suicide in physicians and uh, how we can prevent it. And it's not just pieces for the staff and uh, in the break room. Um, the other thing to be aware of is October 17th, we're having the Hunt Lecture where uh, we're talking about music medicine and med chi. Um, music uh, can be used for all kinds of things to uh, help and soothe both physicians and patients. And uh, we'll talk about the problems that uh, musicians uh, can get into. So on that, uh, I wanna thank everybody again for uh, participating uh, in this uh, very timely and uh, disturbing uh, topic. Uh, but we'll continue to talk about it in, in the future. Thank you. All right, with that, Debbie, you wanna take us out? Yeah, I just wanted to say that the evaluation form was in the chat this evening, but you also get an email um, in the next couple of days with the uh, link for the uh, evaluation. You need to fill out evaluations to get your CME certificate. So thank you for attending everyone. And with that, we will sign off. Bye-bye. Thanks. Okay, thank you all again. Bye. Bye.